everyone, this is Julia with an addendum to my last video. <laughs> oh my God, so I told you all before that someone had asked for my address to send me a gift. And um, I received that today from my brother. And shut up! Oh my God, look what it is! <laughs> Yeah, I'm a little bit excited. Someone sent me Grateful Dead fabric. Um, so those are this little one is called Bertha, the the skeleton girl there. Her name's Bertha, Bertha the skeleton. Um, this is one of the classic Grateful Dead symbols. It's my absolute well, steal your face and Bertha are my absolute favorite Grateful Dead symbols. This is so awesome. Um, so this is like a yard or a yard and a quarter oh my god i'm so absolutely stoked about this gift terry thanks so much i really dig what you um <laughs> my face is hurting a little bit from smiling i really dig what you chose to send me for this gift and one of the things that's so cool about this fabric is i'm often look I'm often looking for one little patch or one little symbol that I can put on clothing. And the Grateful Dead patches that look like this are like $6, $5, $6 a piece. Um, and what I'm going to use a lot of this for, um, though I may make a mask out of it too for myself. <laughs> Maybe a couple for the store. But um, I can cut out each one of these Um what I'm saying is I can put Grateful Dead on everything. <laughs> there might be a Grateful Dead one right here and you wouldn't even see it. Or maybe one over here. Or just right here on the back of a shirt. You just never know. Grateful Dead, it's everywhere. So, <sighs> I just had to do this little video real quick to just say how totally stoked, totally stoked I am with this gift. I really, really <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um... This makes me think of another weird thing that just happened. I was watching this weird video. Um, I think it's called A Different Reality. And um, they're talking about the whole history of things and how ever more we've created this false or fake world. And then they start talking about the internet coming, coming up and the first coining of the word cyberspace by this author whose name I can't remember right now and how he was saying it was going to be a really sort of negative, um, negative thing. And then another guy came along, um, and in this video they're like, yeah, John Perry Barlow. And I'm like, John Perry Barlow, that's one of the lyricists for the Grateful Dead. That guy wrote songs with Bob Weir. And those were a lot of times the cowboyish type songs that the Grateful Dead would do. And songs like, um, that come from the album Working Man's Dead. If you like um, Working Man's music, country music, you would really like those Grateful Dead songs. So Grateful Dead has everything from psychedelia to um, country and jazz. So um, I was like, that's the lyricist for the Grateful Dead. And then he goes on to explain that John Perry Barlow was an early thinker as well about the internet and cyberspace and what the potentiality of that was. And um, in fact, deadheads were some of the first people to use email and to be on the World Wide Web because they were connecting with each other basically about tape trading. Because, okay, another fact you might not know, the Grateful Dead was the first band probably in history, modern history, to allow their fans to bring in recording equipment into their live concerts, they would set up a little place for them called uh, the tapers section. This is back in the day of tapes. And they would let them come in and actually record the live concert. And the, and the rule was, you can record all of these for free and take them with you, but you can't sell them. You can only trade them. So before the internet, there was this whole network of deadheads across the country and the world trading um, live shows on tape. Um, I met one of those tapers back in 89. It was a show at the... Um, I'm getting really off on a tangent here, but... Um, uh, my ride left, and I'm standing there in a parking lot after a three-day run. It was at Monterey. Um, these were some famous shows, too. Another story. Because the Grateful Dead recorded their music video, um, Touch of Grey, there. And I remember some guys, some staff guys from the Dead coming out and going, Does anybody want to come into the venue pre 
pre-enter in order to be part of this recording for our music video. And I was, and you know, I was like, that is so corporate music video. Grateful Dead's not music video you know so I didn't participate but that music video is the music video for Touch of Grey and of course they had the whole audience there and they have the band playing on stage just skeletons pretending they're the band playing is so, so funny um so um Laguna Seca Monterey those are those shows so anyway um three shows it was awesome so my ride had left me and I'm standing there in the middle of a parking lot and um this guy comes up and I was like is anybody going towards San Diego? And he was like, yeah, I am. I'll take you. So he ended up taking me back and he had a stack of papers, pages this thick. And each page with listings and listings of live recordings he had on tape for trading. He said any, you know, and you could copy them too. He said, any of these that you want, just uh, write me. There were no texting or anything like that then. No mobile phones. Uh, maybe the earliest ones. And um, I'll make you those tapes. I never did. But yeah, I had that, he gave me that whole, just to make the copies of the pages of the tapes back then was like 50 cents a copy and it was practically a book, you know. So anyway, <laughs> tapers used to be able to come into the shows and record the live Grateful Dead shows. And that's how all of that music spread so widely, so vastly um, to so many people and people could see the diversity of their music and that each show was completely different. And it really bonded the community um, in a big way. And it really grew their fan base. And other bands learned from that experience. In fact, the whole movement called uh, Jam jam music and all of the music festivals. These were all outgrowths of the Grateful Dead. The band Fish, the band Widespread Panic, my favorite band. Um, all of these are outgrowths of what the Grateful Dead did and what they showed was possible for bands to do. I mean, they signed with different record labels, but they didn't have to to grow a fan base or to make money because they sold out each and every show, <laughs> just like Widespread Panic does still today, 35 years later. They started in 85. Grateful Dead started in 65, right? Yeah, but they weren't called that. They were called the um, Uptown Jug Band, and then they were called the Warlocks. Then they were called the Grateful Dead, and that stuck. Anyway, so tapers. I was talking about tapers. Um, the Laguna Seca shows. Right, right, John Perry Barlow. <laughs> so the other thing that John Perry Barlow was doing besides writing lyrics with Bob Weir for The Grateful Dead was involved in this new electronic frontier. And he started a group called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And he wrote a manifesto in 1996 based on his idea where he flipped this idea of cyberspace as a really bad sort of Orwellian thing to what he envisioned a more utopian thing, a place where we could build a community, a place that we would not be censored, a place where we didn't need government control, all of that. So he's got this manifesto. Go ahead and Google it. John Barlow or John Perry Barlow, um, 1996 manifesto. And you can read it there, and it's really amazing because it really addresses what's going on online now with the censorship that's going on. I mean, in order for me to do a video using the word, which I'm not even going to use here because it'll happen again, the big thing that's going on now, if you use one of those words for that, um, you get lower in the rankings. They might also uh, demonetize your video, or suddenly you could lose like 20 subscribers just out of nowhere with no indication in the stats for your channel where their subscribers or when they left, where they went or when they left. You could, and you'll also have a big banner underneath the video, as you all know, directing you to the appropriate authorities who apparently have the exact correct information that you should listen to, rather than having this broad wealth of potential information, and then it would be your or my responsibility to decipher through that and have the discernment, have the ability to research it, um, have the ability to determine what the sources are for a particular source of information, rather than relying on, you know, like YouTube saying, hey, these are the official sources of this information and anything else is you're going to have to wear a tinfoil hat to uh, listen to or take with any credibility. This kind of censorship that's going on right now where a tech company gets to decide what's real information or not, what's fake news or not. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. A guy like the CorbettReport.com, um, Cor CorbettReport videos on YouTube are one of my 
that's one of my favorite channels. I've learned so much from that channel. And independent reviewers call him a tinfoil hat wearing guy. What's going on here, you know? So John Perry Barlow um, talked about this way back in 1996 before any of us were even involved with these social media sites or any of that stuff. So that was just a weird little Grateful Dead connection that came into some random weird um, video I was watching. Everything's connected, everything lines up, everything's in a flow. Th that sort of thing used to always happen at the Grateful Dead. That's probably the first place I realized about the flow. Other than the religious texts I was always reading as a kid um, and spiritual texts and weird alternative texts. Um, like the Bhagavad Gita from India. That's a spiritual text, not a weird alternative text. <laughs> But um, uh, the Grateful Dead, what would happen at the Grateful Dead before the days of cell phones, and it still happens now, um, is there would be thousands and thousands and thousands of people at the concert, and you were supposed to meet your one friend if you could find them, and without trying and no billboard, no cell phones, you'd happen to not be able to find them all day, so you finally got in line, and who's in line right in front of you, and they turn around, it's the friend you've been looking for all day, and that's what would happen at the Grateful Dead, or you wouldn't find your friend, and you'd go into the venue with thousands of people, and that one seat that was open, you got there, and you sit down, and you look behind you, and there's your friend, <laughs> so that would happen all the time at the Grateful Dead, it was a great place for witnessing the interconnectedness of all things, quantum entanglement, and the lining up and flowing of everything, the way, the Tao Te Ching, the, the trust in the universe, trusting that you're going in the right direction. You've got yourself open to all possibilities and you're not in a controlling or yang mode. You're in a ying mode. You're an empty vessel. You are trusting because you are one with all. So you're not going to be left behind. You are loved. You you are one with all that is. So what is there to fear? <laughs> so the Grateful Dead is probably the first place I ever learned anything like that. And widespread panic is the second place. Oh my God, I have to show you another thing. Um, so I just met with my brother and back in... Sometime when I was in college, between 88 and 93, I think... Um, my brother's running a little Mexico a company down where they took spring breakers down to Baja, Mexico. And my godmother was involved too. And then they just throw them these big parties. And back then, Baja was not as developed as it is. And you had these cool places. So one time, my brother and my godmother were like, well, come down with us. And my sister came too. And we all sort of, after all the kids left, had our own vacation. And we went into Mexico into these cold springs. So Mexico was hot and desert-like. And in the middle of that was an oasis of cold springs, not hot springs. And we would, um, you know, camp out there for a few days in the cold springs. There was no electricity or anything back then. And we drove across this dry um, lake bed, which is called a playa, and um, picked up these two Mexican guys um, they didn't have any water and we gave them water and we were in a VW bus too and we picked them up and then we went and got some tacos or something. <laughs> it was this great trip down to Mexico that my brother took me and while we were there we took this picture and this is the little undeveloped beach that we stayed at. Now this is a picture of me. <laughs> um, I have really baggy pants on and I'm on a boat that says Julia. Isn't it great? <laughs> so he just gave me that picture. Because he's going through... Oh, I missed that bathing suit top. That was a body glove top. Anyway, <laughs> he's uh, going through all of his um, stuff in their garage now at home since he's been off work. So, And he says some of his employees that he's talking to now... Um, who are, have applied for unemployment, he, they don't want to come back to work because they're making more now than when they worked, but they do want to come back. So my brother and I were talking about how, you know, you give people maybe 60, 70, 80% of their income while they're away. You don't give them more than their income to so make them not come back. That's ridiculous. And that's what we're doing, of course. So anyway, my brother, I love him. I love this memory. I love what my stomach looked like back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely making me a mask out of this. So once again, Trish, thanks so much. I hope you don't mind me saying your name. Jeez, golly. Yeah, it's okay. So I... 
really appreciate this. And I'll let you all go. This was meant to be just a quick video, but I guess it went off on a big Grateful Dead story. I hope you enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. All right. Have a beautiful day. Bye.